Hi guys, all right, welcome to the continuing adventures of Odysseus. Uh, remember previously on the Odyssey, Odysseus was instructed by Circe to go to the land of the dead so he could hear what was in store for him from the blind prophet Tiresias. Um, so where we're picking it up is that Odysseus has returned to Cer Circe after going to the land of the dead and she has some warnings for him as well, okay? And remember this is all still one big flashback uh, while Odysseus is speaking to King Alcinous and his court. So, this uh, quote right here where, where we start reading is actually Circe speaking to Odysseus about what's in store. Listen with care to this now, and a god will arm your mind. Square in your ship's path are sirens, crying beauty to bewitch men coasting by. Woe to the innocent who hears that sound. He will not see his lady nor his children in joy crowding about him home from sea. The sirens will sing his mind away on their sweet meadow lolling. There are bones of dead men rotting in a pile beside them and flayed skins shrivel around the spot. So she describes these creatures, the sirens, who sing this beautiful bewitching song. It's a magical song that almost is like hypnotic. It draws um, sailors who pass by them towards the island and they just, all they care about now is hearing that sound, okay? And they will never see their, their wives or their children again um, because the sirens will sing his mind away. So Circe describes the sirens and warns Odysseus of their deadly song. Now here's a question for you to answer uh, and include some embedded quotations. Many of the creatures Odysseus faces, like the lotus eaters, Circe, and the sirens, have a similar effect on their victims. What do you think is the significance of this pattern, and how might this relate to the experience of soldiers and veterans returning from war? So this may require you to look back a bit at these other adventures of uh, what did the Lotus Eaters do to the men, what did Circe do to the men, and what did the Sirens do, and what, what's the pattern there? What is similar about the way these creatures affect their victims? I'm going backwards. There we go. Okay. She says, Circe tells him, steer wide, keep well to seaward, plug your oarsman's ears with beeswax kneaded soft. None of the rest should hear that song. So steer wide around them, avoid those sirens. And in fact, put beeswax in the men's ears, right? Soften it up, put it in their ears, plug their ears so they can't hear it. But if you wish to listen, let the men tie you in the lugger, hand and foot back to the mast, lash to the mast, so you may hear those harpies thrilling voices. Shout as you will, begging to be untied. Your crew must only twist more line around you and keep their stroke up till the singers fade. Okay, but she says, Odysseus, if you want to hear their song, if you want to listen to the siren song, you have to have your men tie you to the mast. The mast is the big um, pole in the middle of the ship that the sail attaches to. She says, you have to have your men tie you to that mast um, you can listen to their thrilling voices, and when you hear them, you're going to beg your men to untie you so you can go to them, but you have to tell your crew they should only just tie you tighter and get clear of the, um, the sirens. Why is this lagging so much? So, Circe instructs Odysseus to have his men put softened beeswax in their ears to block the sound of the sirens. He tells Odysseus that if he alone wants to hear the song, he should have his men tie him to the mast. And even when he begs to be released, his crew must tie him even tighter and keep rowing until they are out of danger. Now the next peril, uh, that uh, it lies between two headlands. So Circe continues warning, and headlands means there's this narrow passage of water between two sort of uh, steep cliffs, okay? So it's a small area that the ship has to pass through, and there's dangers on either side of that narrow strait. Okay, she describes what's on one side. That is the den of Scylla, where she yaps abominably, a newborn whelp's cry, though she is huge and monstrous. So he, she begins to describe this creature named Scylla, um, who cries like a newborn puppy. A whelp is a puppy, so it's got this really ironic sort of 
noise it makes, even though it's a huge, monstrous thing. God or man, no one could look on her and joy. Her legs, and there are twelve, are like great tentacles, unjointed. And upon her serpent necks are born six heads like nightmares of ferocity, with triple serried rows of fangs and deep gullets of black death. Okay, This monster has twelve uh, tentacle-like legs, and she has six snake-like necks that have a head on the end of each one. They are nightmares of ferocity. And they have triple um, serried, is like serrated, jagged rows of fangs and deep black gullets of death, right? Your gullet is your throat. So there's this huge, gross, six-headed monster that sits on one side, okay? Half her length, she sways her heads in air outside her horrid cleft. So these big heads swing sort of off the cliff where she sits. Uh, hunting the sea around that promontory for dolphins, dogfish, or what bigger game, thundering amphitrite feeds in thousands, okay? And she hunts in that those waters for dolphins or dogfish or whatever um, creatures the goddess of the sea can, can create. And no ship's company can claim to have passed her without loss and grief. She takes from every ship one man for every gullet. So in any ship that passes her, suffers loss and grief because for every ship that passes by, she takes one man off of that ship for each gullet, for each throat. So on one side of the strait is Scylla, the six-headed man-eating monster, and Circe describes Scylla's frightful appearance and hunting habits, and for every ship that passes near the monster, Scylla eats six men, when one for each head. So that's on one side. Now, what's on the other side? The opposite point seems more a tongue of land you'd touch with a good bow shot at the Narrows. So it's just this one sort of like peninsula sticking out into the water. Uh, a great wild fig, a sh shaggy mass of leaves grows on it, and Charybdis lurks below to swallow down the dark sea tide. Three times from dawn to dusk, she spews it up and sucks it down again three times, a whirling maelstrom. If you come upon her, then the god who makes the earth tremble could not save you. No, hug the cliff of Scylla, take your ship through on a racing stroke. Better to mourn six men than lose them all and the ship too. So on the opposite side, there's this little tongue of land that sticks out. There's a big shaggy um, tree on top of it. And underneath that, under the water, is a monster that creates these whirlpools three times a day, whirlpools that suck everything down and shoots back up, okay? And that if, if Odysseus steers his boat near that, the whole ship is going down, okay? <clears throat> My new stupid thing. There we go. So on the other side of the strait is a thin strip of land with a large fig tree, and just below that is Charybdis, an undersea monster that creates a giant whirlpool capable of swallowing entire ships. Circe advises Odysseus to steer his ship closer to the Scylla side. What you need to answer now with an embedded quote is what is her reasoning for this advice? What reason does she give for steering towards the Scylla side of things? Okay. She's going to finish her warnings here. Then you will coast Thrinakia, the island where Helios's cattle graze, fine herds and flocks of goodly sheep. The herds and flocks are seven, with fifty beasts in each. No lambs are dropped or calves, and these fat cattle never die, okay? Then she says, you're going to go past Thrinakia, which you've heard about already. This is the island where Helios's cattle are. They're magical cattle. They never have babies or anything like that. They never die. They're these immortal cows. And she gives the same warning that Tiresias gives. Now give those kind a wide berth, steer wide around them. Keep your thoughts intent upon your course for home, and hard seafaring brings you all to Ithaca. But if you raid the beeves, I see destruction for ship and crew. Okay, so she gives the exact same warning that Tiresias gave. Uh, she warns Odysseus about the cattle of the sun god, and she informs him that if they disturb the cattle, she sees destruction for ship and crew. Okay, so the Ithacans set off. Uh, Odysseus and his men, they leave Circe's island. They have all their warnings. Uh, Odysseus does not tell his men of Circe's last prophecy, that he will be the sole survivor. So he keeps that little bit to himself, that he's going to be the only one to survive. Uh, remember, he is still speaking to King Alcinous in his court. 
So now we're hearing Odysseus's voice. The crew being now silent before me, I address them, sore at heart. Dear friends, more than one man or two should know these things Circe foresaw for us and shared with me. So let me tell her forecast. Then we die with our eyes wide open if we are going to die or know what death we baffle if we can. Okay, so he says, dear friends, I should share with you some of the information that Circe gave me. Okay, we should die with our eyes open. We should know what we're about to face. Sirens weaving a haunting song over the sea we are to shun. We should avoid those sirens, she said, and their green shore all sweet with clover. Yet she urged that I alone should listen to their song. Therefore you are to tie me up, tight as a splint, erect along the mast, lashed to the mast, and if I shout and beg to be untied, take more turns of the rope to muffle me. Odysseus tells his men about what they will face, and he gives those instructions for dealing with the sirens. I rather dwelt upon this part of the forecast where, while our good ship made time bound outward down the wind for the strange island of the sirens. Then all at once the wind fell, and a calm came over all the sea as though some power lulled the swell. So the, uh, the wind dies down all of a sudden. The crew were on their feet briskly to furl the sail and stow it. Then each in place they poised the smooth oar blades and sent the white foam scudding by. I carved a massive cake of beeswax into bits and rolled them in my hands until they softened. No long task for a burning heat came down from Helios, Lord of high noon. Okay, so he says the winds died down. His men wrapped up the sail. They attended to their oars so they could keep rowing by. Um, he's got the beeswax. He's softening his hands. It's a hot day, so it's not too difficult to do. Going forward, I carried wax along the line and laid it thick on their ears. Stops up their ears with the wax. They tied me up, then plumb amidships, back to the mast, lashed to the mast, and took themselves again to rowing. So they tie me up, standing up to the mast. Soon as we came smartly within hailing distance, the two sirens noting our fast ship off their point made ready, and they sang. And so as they come within distance and the sirens spot them, they start to sing. Okay, so there's your notes. As they approach, the wind dies down, they begin to row. And following the advice of Circe, they put the beeswax on their ears, except for Odysseus, who is tied to the mast. Kind of like that. So here the sirens sing. The lovely voices in ardor, that's passion, these passionate voices, appealing over the water made me crave to listen. And I tried to say, untie me to the crew, jerking my brows, but they bent steady to the oars. Then Perimides got to his feet, he and Eurylochus, and passed more line about to hold me still. So all rolled on, rode on until the sirens dropped under the sea rim and their singing dwindled away. <clears throat> so they get past. My faithful company rested on their oars now, peeling off the wax that I had laid thick on their ears, then set me free. Okay, so as they pass, he does hear their singing. He begs to be untied, just like Circe predicted. They obey the instructions. They keep, tie, keep him tied up, and they are able to pass the siren safely. We still have Charybdis and Scylla to deal with. But scarcely had that island faded in blue air when I saw smoke and white water with sound of waves and tumult. He starts to see the sort of spray and the, the choppy waves caused by the whirlpool. A sound the men heard and it terrified them. Oars flew from their hands. The blades went knocking wild alongside till the ship lost way with no oar blades to drive her through the water. So the men hear this sound and it freaks them out and they drop their oars and they start to kind of drift off in the wrong way. Okay, so Odysseus has got to get these guys back together. Click. Well, I walked up and down from bow to stern, trying to put heart into them, standing ev over every oarsman, saying gently, okay, so he walks up and down, and he's going to give him like this pep talk. Friends, have we never been in danger before this? More fearsome is it now than when the Cyclops penned us in his cave. What power he had. Did I not keep my nerve and use my wits to find a way out for us? Now I say, by hook or crook, this peril too shall be something we remember. Okay, so he's like, we've been through worse, right? This is no worse than when the Cyclops had, a, had us trapped in his cave, and didn't I get us out of that one? I'll get us out of this one, too. It'll, it'll be a memory before long. 
Heads up, lads, we must obey the orders as I give them. Get the oar shafts in your hands and lie back hard on your benches. Hit these breaking seas. Zeus, help us pull away before we founder. You with the tiller, listen and take in all that I say. The rudders are your duty. Keep her out of the combers and the smoke. Steer for that headland. Watch the drift or we fetch up in the smother and you drown us. Okay, come on, boys. He gives them the pep talk. Obey, listen to what I have to say. Grab those oars, row hard. He talks to the tiller, that's the guy steering the ship. You're in charge of the rudders, okay? Stay away from that whirlpool. Keep out of those rough waves and out of that spray. Steer for that headland, okay? Don't get caught in that whirlpool. Okay, so when they hear the noise of the whirlpool Charybdis, the men become frightened. Odysseus tries to encourage them by reminding them of all the dangers they've escaped so far, and he directs his men to steer away from the whirlpool towards the cliffs. And we know on the cliffs is Scylla. That was all, and it brought them round to action. Okay, so that, that snapped his men into action. But as I sent them on towards Scylla, I told them nothing, as they could do nothing. They would have dropped their oars again in panic to roll for cover under the decking. Circe's bidding against arms had slipped my mind, so I tied on my cuirass and took up two heavy spears and then made my way along to the foredeck, thinking to see her first from there, the monster of the gray rock, harboring torment for my friends. I strained my eyes upon that cliffside, veiled in cloud, but nowhere could I catch sight of her. Okay, So he doesn't tell them about Scylla. He tells them to avoid Charybdis, watch out for that whirlpool, but he doesn't tell them what's on that other cliff. And he says they would have dropped their oars in, again in panic to roll for a cover under the decking. Um, he says that he forgot that Circe told him, don't bother with weapons, it's not going to make a difference. And he sort of takes a couple of spears and he's trying to search these cloudy cliffs to see if he can spot Scylla and maybe prevent what's going to happen. Uh, so as they approach, he doesn't tell his men about the many-headed monster. You need to answer with embedded quotes, why does Odysseus not share this information with his crew? Why does, he to share, why does he decide not to share that information? He draws his weapons and he searches the cloudy cliff for sight of Scylla. And all this time in travail, sobbing, gaining on the current, we rode into the strait, Scylla to port and on our starboard beam, Charybdis, dire gorge of the salt sea. Okay, so he describes it, here we go, passing between this, these two dangers in this narrow strait. By heaven, when she vomited, all the sea was like a cauldron seething over intense fire when the mixture suddenly heaves and rises. So now he starts to describe what it was like when that whirlpool starts bubbling and going, okay? When she, she meaning Charybdis, vomited, when, when it started to bubble up, the whole sea was like a cauldron, like a big pot on a fire, seething over intense fire when the mixture suddenly heaves and rises. So it was like when a pot on a fire boils over. Okay, and here we have an epic simile. The shock spume soared to the landside heights and fell like rain. So this water sprays up into the sky, falls like rain. But then when she swallowed the seawater down, we saw the funnel of the maelstrom, heard the rock bellowing all around, and dark sand raged on the bottom far below. I always picture at this part, you know, at the end of Little Mermaid, when um, Ursula gets the whole sea spinning around, and you can actually see all the way to the bottom, and Ariel sitting down there. That's kind of what this is like. My men blanched against the gloom they all went white our eyes were fixed upon that yawning mouth of, of in fear of being devoured okay so odysseus describes the violent whirlpool of charybdis and you need to tell me what is the epic simile he uses make sure to include some direct quotations all right so as they're all kind of looking at charybdis over here bubbling like a cauldron then scylla made her strike whisking six of my best men from the ship. Boom, 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 boom. All six of them snatched right off the ship. I happened to glance aft at ship and oarsmen and caught sight of their arms and legs dangling high overhead. Voices came down to me in anguish, calling my name for the last time, okay? He just sees them as they're being lifted up off the boat, their arms and their legs sort of hanging above him, their voices calling out to him. 
A man surf casting on a point of rock for bass or mackerel, whipping his long rod to drop the sinker and the bait far out will hook a fish and rip it from the surface to dangle wriggling through the air. So these were borne aloft in spasms toward the cliff. We have another epic simile here. He's trying to describe what the men looked like as they were being pulled off of the ship by this monster. He compares it to someone who's fishing, who throws their bait out and then they catch a fish and they sort of rip it out of the water and they're holding it there for a second as it wiggles in the air. She ate them as they shrieked there in her den in the dire grapple, reaching still for me and deathly pity ran through me at that sight. Far worst I ever suffered questing the passes of the strange sea. Okay, so he even says, this was the worst thing I ever had to experience in all of my um, journeys here on the sea. Come on. Then Scylla strikes, grabbing six men off the ship. I want you to tell me what epic simile he uses to describe this. And Odysseus says that this was the worst experience of his entire journey. Now you tell me, what does this show us about Odysseus as a leader? Another image of Scylla there. We rode on, the rocks were behind now, Charybdis too, and Scylla dropped astern. So they get out. They've obviously lost the six men, but they get out. Then we were coasting the noble island of the god, where grazed those cattle with wide brows and bounteous flocks of Helios, lord of noon, who rides high heaven. From the black ship, still far at sea, I heard the lowing of the cattle winding home and sheep bleeding and heard too in my heart the words of blind Tiresias of Thebes and Circe of Aea. Both forbade me the island of the world's delight, the sun. So as they get out and they're coasting, he knows, he can see it, the island of Helios where those cattle are. He can even hear the cattle mooing from where he is. And he also remembers the warning he was given by both Tiresias and Circe about avoiding those cattle. So as they clear the Strait of Scylla and Charybdis, Odysseus sees the island of Thernaki in the distance and hears the sounds of Helios' cattle. He is reminded of Tiresias and Circe's warnings. Okay, that's it for now. Uh, rather than an open note quiz, what I'd like you to do for the next class is to have those questions that I pointed out in bold and italics throughout the passage, I want you to answer those um, and include embedded quotations in all of your answers. All right, thanks, see you next time.